the scripture reading for today comes from John chapter 7, verses 17 through 39. Quite long, but uh, we'll read responsibly. John chapter 7, verses 17 through 39. I'll read verse 17, you can read verse 18, and so on. John chapter 7, verse 17. If anyone is willing to do this, do his will, he will know of the teaching whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon who seeks to kill you. Jesus answered them, I did one deed. And you all marvel. For this reason, Moses has given your circumcision, not because it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, is this not the man whom they are seeking to kill? Look, he is speaking publicly, and they are saying nothing to him. The rulers do not really know what this is the Christ today. However, we know where this man is from, but when, uh, whenever the Christ may come, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out in the temple, teaching and saying, You both know me and know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sends me is true, whom you do not know. I know him because I am from him, and he sends me. So they were seeking to seize him, and no man laid hand on him, because his hour has not yet come. But many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, When the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. Therefore Jesus said, For a little while longer I am with you, then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews then said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He is not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? What is the statement that he said? You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures say, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this, let us read together. But this is the book of the Spirit, whom those who believe in him will receive. receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified yet. This is the Word of God. Um, the title for today's mes uh, message, uh, we're going to cover John chapter se uh, 7 uh, in, the, in our study series of, uh, of the Gospel of John and Jesus Christ. And the title is Jesus, the Giver of Water. The giver of water. In um, the beginning of John chapter 7, I'll read it for you. Um, uh, rather than reading for you, it says that it is the Feast of Booths. And uh, he's, if you know the story, uh, his brothers come and his brothers do not believe in Jesus. And they're uh, giving him a hard time. Hey brother, if you are really the Messiah, why, don't you, why aren't you active in Jerusalem? And Jesus gets upset, it seems like. He says, I'm not going to go, you guys go up. Okay? And then later he comes. But in, throughout the chapter, uh, we need to kind of remember where it began. Uh, let us uh, kind of uh, trace back to Gen John chapter 5, where Jesus healed the, the man who was sick for 38 years. Right? He was waiting for the water to be stirred and so on. And it was on the Sabbath, and people were attacking Jesus because of that, saying that he's a heretic and so on. And then it comes to John chapter 6. And before coming to John chapter 6, Jesus tells them 
You guys don't know, but I, what I do and what I speak, what I say, is all from the Father who sends me. And so Jesus starts to, to explain about his relationship with the Father. And then he proves it in chapter 6 by feeding them bread, multiplying the, the five loaves of bread into fish, and then walking on water. All these miracles, uh, the people see, the disciples see, and Jesus after that says, I am the manna from heaven, I am the one that came down from heaven. And then chapter 7, he begins to teach, actually. Teach about who he is and teach different things. But people are adamant about not believing in him. So the question that I want to start off with is, what is it that causes us not to believe? It's not because they cannot, cannot believe. It's not because they don't have all the proofs. Because here they're talking about when the Messiah comes, you, you, you don't know where is he from, where he's from, and you don't know where he's going, and so on, but we know where this guy's from. All these speculations and all these evidence and proofs, it's not because they don't have it. But then, what is, what is causing them to refuse to believe? And let us ask ourselves, what's causing us sometimes to refuse to believe? We say, we just cannot believe. We say, this is troubling me. We say this and that. But what is it actually that troubles, that causes us? And so Jesus starts off in today's uh, passage, what we read. He says, true teaching, the truth is you don't teach the falsehood. You don't teach for, your, for myself. I'm speaking the truth. I'm telling you the truth. I'm teaching the truth. And... Proof is that I don't teach for myself. I teach for the glory of God. But you, Jesus is basically saying, but you guys, how do you guys teach? And what do you guys feed on? And another point is, in today's passage, it says it's near, it's, it's the Feast of Booths, also known as the Feast of the Tabernacles. And God, God commands the Israelites from the Old Testament actually from the, the wilderness journey, uh, to remember and observe these feasts, also known as holidays, holy days. Right? So uh, our children uh, who are going to school are waiting for the holidays. Holidays are not, children listen, holidays are not for playing only. Holidays are for worshiping God. Amen? Amen. I want to hear some children <laughs> no? <laughs> I feel like I started BBS already. Yeah. These are the main holidays, holy days, feasts that God commanded the Israelites to observe and remember. The Passover, we, uh, most of this will be a review for a lot of you. In Passover, Feast of the Unleavened Bread, Feast of the First Fruits, Feast of Weeks, Feast of the Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, Feast of the Tabernacles. Okay? And these seven holidays are considered among the most important Jewish holidays. But the Bible tells us these are not Jewish holidays. The Bible tells us these are God's days. God's days. And they are instituted during the Exodus and the wilderness journey. And they were designed so that the Israelites and later Christians, believers, can remember God's redemptive work. And, uh, and this becomes, these days become a blueprint and a type of the entire history of redemption. So it can be, it, it becomes, the seven, seven holidays become an outline, timeline for the entire history of redemption. And today, in today's passage, it's the Feast of the Tabernacle, the seventh one. So all the more important for the Israelites and for us to study. And these holidays are called Mikra. Uh, Mikra doesn't di directly translate as holiday or feast. It means uh, to it means gathering. It means convocation, right? 
Mikra, in Hebrew, Mikra serves four purposes. First, to remember God's saving work in Egypt and wilderness. Second, to remember uh, reminders for the people to give thanks to God in these times. And most of these times are harvest times. So we're waiting, we're, uh, soon, in a couple weeks, we are celebrating Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving coincides somehow, uh, similar times as the, the time of uh, the Feast of the, the Tabernacles also. So uh, during these harvest seasons, Mikras are concentrated in uh, or emphasizes in uh, giving thanks to God. Third, as prophecy of the Messiah's work. When the Messiah comes, he will do these things. Okay? It's the declaration prophecy. And what is interesting now, as we are studying in the book of John, John emphasizes a lot on what Jesus did on these days. And today is one of the most important days holidays up for the Jews and for the for God in the Bible and what was Jesus doing first Jesus was teaching Jesus was teaching teaching the people who are adamantly uh, stern and, and hard in their hearts to not believe so Jesus's teaching is is right now fighting against the non-belief and not only, don't try to only think about back then, think about today. The Word of God trying to teach my heart that is resisting from listening, that is resisting from, from being completely believing. Fourth, to outline the times in redemptive history. The first four of the seven feasts occurred during the springtime. It passed over unleavened bread, first fruits, and, and the Feast of Weeks or, or Pentecost, right? So these happen in the springtime, and they all have already been fulfilled by Christ in the New Testament, according to uh, what, what they signify. But the final three holidays, the Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles, they all happen in the month of Tishri, within about 15, 21 days. And so these are the autumn, fall, holidays and they all, uh, all uh, signify the time in history of them that we are still waiting for basically something that will happen with the second coming of so these seven are divided into four and three and the last three are the main focus for us especially Christians because they are things that need to be fulfilled so let us look at the summary of each feast. First, Passover, Leviticus 23, verse 5. This day pointed to the Messiah as our Passover lamb, whose blood would be shed for our sins. Jesus was crucified on the day of uh, preparation for the Passover. Basically, he it was on this exactly the same day, at the same hour that the lamb uh, lambs were being slaughtered for the Passover meal that evening. Second, unleavened bread. This day pointed to Messiah's sinless life. Unleavened bread is the bread without leaven. Okay? And in the Bible, in the Gospels, Jesus say the leaven represents hypocrisy, sin. Right? And so that with Jesus is the bread of life without leaven, without sin. Making him the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And Jesus' body was in the grave during the first days of this feast. Like a kernel of wheat planted. This is the time they... Uh, Passover is a time of sowing. And this is the time when they are... Wait, oh no, Passover is the first beginning of the first harvest. And so it's, it's not... It hasn't really come out yet. It hasn't ripened yet but they're waiting for the barley harvest. And so Jesus is like a kernel getting ready to pop out to show that it is, it is uh, ready to be harvested. Jesus is in the tomb, ready to come out. Third, first fruits pointed to the Messiah's resurrection. 
as the first fruit of the righteous. Jesus was resurrected on this very day, which is one of the reasons that Paul refers to him in 1 Corinthians 15 20 as the first fruits from the dead. So, Jesus, the day of resurrection was the day of the first fruits. And then the Feast of Weeks is also known as Pentecost. Pentecost is a term that was used also in the, New uh, in the Old Testament, not only the day when the Holy Spirit came down. And it's the day after seven Sabbaths, Sabbath days, counting from the day after the Sabbath, that follows the Passover. So the day after the Passover is the Sabbath, regardless of the, the day of the week. And from there, seven Sabbath days, and then the day after. So basically, um, 50, 50th day. Okay. Yeah. So, Jesus dies on the cross and he resurrects. And after the resurrection, he resurrects the first day after the Sabbath, right? Okay. And from there, he stays on this earth for 40 days. And then he ascends up to heaven. And how many days later? 10 days later, altogether 50. Days, 50th day, the Holy Spirit comes down. That's the Pentecost. It's known as the Feast of the Harvest, Feast of Weeks, and Feast of the First Fruits. The first harvest of weeks, uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. It says, The first fruit of Jesus' ministry and the cross was gathered at the Pentecost. And this is the day when they gather in the first harvest after, uh, uh, after the Passover. And it was the beginning point of the New Testament church. Secondly, it is the day when Moses received the Torah at Mount Sinai. John chapter 16, verses 12 through 14, Jesus promised that we will receive the Holy Spirit and we will be able to understand the word that he brought to us. Acts chapter 10, verse 44, those who listen to the word will receive the Holy Spirit. So, receiving the day when Moses received the word, and the day when the Holy Spirit came down, this coincides. We do need the Holy Spirit if we want to continue on to until the coming of Jesus. If we want to continue on with our faith, it is impossible without having received the Holy Spirit. I pray that everyone here will receive the Holy Spirit, not only once, but day by day, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. So that if, if the Holy Spirit departs, everything will bother us, everything will become, will be a cause for me becoming dark. Everything will be a cause for me to lose faith. Everything will be a trouble without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, our faces will be dark, even when receiving the word. But if the Holy Spirit comes, we will lighten up. Problems will not seem as problems. When the Holy Spirit, when we have the Holy Spirit, we He gives us the strength to overcome through faith. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? First, Jesus has to resurrect in my humanity. And then Jesus, we need to lift Jesus up, ascension, and we need to receive the Holy Spirit through the Word. And when the Holy Spirit comes, the, we will come to understand the Word. I truly pray in the name of the Lord that everyone here will receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Fifth is the, the day of trumpets, the feast of the trumpets. It's the first day of the seventh month, which is called the Tishri. And trumpets were used to signal wars, convocation, and alarming events. These are the Bible verses that uh, where trumpets were blown. It foreshadows the coming of the Lord uh, that uh, the coming of the Lord was alarmed by the sound of the trumpets. When God came down upon Mount Sinai, they heard the sound of the trumpets. Right? In the end. When there is a uh, last trumpet sounding, 
the dead will rise, and those who are alive will be taken out to heaven. With the sound of the trumpets, the Lord is coming back. So, blowing the trumpet was seen at Mount Sinai, or, or heard at Mount Sinai, and it is also prophesied in Revelation. It signifies the proclamation of the Word of God. So, has in our timeline of redemptive history, has this happened yet? Blowing of the trumpets. Is this happening? Can we be a little bit more confident? Yes. You can say amen if you believe. Let me ask again. Ready? Have we come to the day of trumpets already? Amen. Who's the trumpet here? Who's blowing the trumpet? Jesus. Can we all say Zion Church? Amen. Are you not? Then you better repent. You know. Why are we spending so much time, energy, and effort, and you know, money to go out to different countries? Why are we doing that? Number one, it's to save those people. Secondly, it's a it's a call of our Father to let the alarming sound go out. It is only when this word goes reaches the end of the earth then He will come. So, if we want Him to. If we want Jesus to hurry up and come, we better hurry up and blow that trumpet. Amen. That trumpet sound needs to be heard by all the people on this earth. The sound of the gospel, the good news. This is a very important sign of the end time. Trumpet sounds also gathered God's people. See, not all people knew how to listen to the trumpets. It, it, had, it was blown in codes. Long sound, short sound, long and short, or three short sounds, all these codes. Only those who have the ears to hear could hear the sound of the trumpets. In the end time, those who have the ears to hear will gather. And that's when God will proclaim His word and the end will come. And then the sixth is the Day of Atonement. The tenth day of the seventh month. This is the day on which people of God afflicted themselves. Basically fasted and they did not, you know, they did not do any, get involved in any uh, entertainment. They turned their phones off. They, they afflicted, you know, for us, just keeping our phones off for the day afflicts us. We get afflicted. Right? But I think, I, I challenge you. For some people, this might be a cause of not coming to church. I challenge you to stay off of these phones and gadgets. I challenge myself first to take a break and instead spend that time with God. I think we more uh, this year's re church retreat should be spending a whole day without our phones reading the Bible. How many people will come to the retreat? I think it will be a great blessing. You will receive the Holy Spirit. So, you see, my question in the beginning was, what is it that causes us from receiving the Holy Spirit so that we can believe? What's blocking that Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is trying to come and I'm busy doing this. Many times I, I, I realize that I am losing precious quality time with my family, precious time with God, precious time with our brothers and sisters in church because of these things. So this is a time when they afflicted themselves really with a repentant heart. And this is the only day they considered, they believed, There's all of their sins are wiped away. Now if, if you had a day this year, one day 
When you come to church and be and really repent, all your sins will be wiped away. Will you come to church on that day? Yes. Even if you have holiday planned, if even if you have, you know, you, you booked that trip two years ago, cannot cancel. Even if you have work, business meeting, will you still come? Yes? Yes. Really? Guess what? Every Sunday, you have 52 times. Is it too many? Is that why you can miss one? You come to pray, God will wipe your sins away. But for the Israelites, it was one time a year. I'm not limiting it to 52 only Sunday. When you come, really pray to God and worship God, your sins are washed away. James tells us, the book of James tells us, if you evangelize us so, God will forget all your past sins. See, we would say, we say, I would do anything to, to get my sins washed away. It's so easy. We have that opportunity every week. Every day. And so they, for them, it was that one day. So they cannot miss that day. So they have to repent. They have to really focus. The, the high priest is working in the temple right now to atone for us. My, all my heart needs to be there. All my prayers need to focus on that. And so that's what they did. When the Lord comes, when the, after the word is Proclaimed that word will wash our sins away. It will lead us to atonement. And this is the day when Daniel, that Daniel uh, prophesied, God gave him revelation of the 70 weeks. Right? 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring, bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal up vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy place. This is what's happening at the very end of redemptive history. And then finally, tabernacles for, or booths. Feast of tabernacles or feast of booths. Seven days from the, as, as it is observed for seven days from the 15th of the seventh month. Very important in terms of harvest. And commemoration of the wilderness journey. Now this this feast is observed with happiness. Day of atonement is you afflict yourself, but your sins are gone now. Now this is the time to celebrate. And tabernacles means God will come and dwell with you now. This is the day when you go to heaven. Finally, the, the dwelling with God and Sabbath. Seven days complete. The tabernacle or tent is where God promised that He would come and dwell with them. It is also the same week when Solomon completed the construction of the temple and gave dedication offering to God. Interesting. Uh, the day when we had our dedication service was during these feasts. Interesting. I want to believe that it is not by coincidence. Thus the Jews call the last day of this feast Hoshana Rabbah. Hoshana, I'll cover this later. Hoshana means, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, right? Hoshana means save us. Rabbah means great. So the great day of salvation. This is the great day of salvation. The festivals of the Bible contain kingdom truth and revelation to each individual. So these are not just feasts or holidays that they keep, these were personal messages from God to us. The one festival that is mentioned in, in connection to the kingdom according to the prophecy of Zechariah is the Feast of the Tabernacles. And this is the day when Jesus was teaching. So let us think about today's passage. In today's passage, Jesus speaks most publicly about himself knowing that there were many who wanted to accuse him. 
they were, there were people already wanting to kill, arrest and kill Jesus. Jesus has been telling people that he teach, what he teaches, that he teaches what the Father shows him and teaches him. John chapter 7 verse 17, if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching. So Jesus is saying, you don't have any excuse. If you really want to believe and learn, you will know what the right teaching is. Usually when, uh, when you see people who are uh, criticizing the teachings of God and the teachings of God's heart, look at their lives. Do you think they live a uh, proper life? So you think, whether it is good for good, uh, it is of God or whether I speak from myself, you will know. So some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, is this not the man whom they are seeking to kill? Look, he is speaking publicly, and they are saying nothing to him. The rulers do not really know that this is Christ, do they? People were, other people, other than the religious leaders, is, I'm speaking about these religious leaders that are, are intentionally not listening to him, intentionally ignoring all the signs and all the proofs, that he is the Messiah. They knew in the head, this must be one, the one. But in the heart and in their life pattern, they just cannot adjust to believe, to accept the fact. But the rest of the people were saying, is this the one? Isn't this the one? Right? Jesus points out that he is teaching the truth for the glory of the Father, but they are not speaking the truth and only interested in their own so this is the answer to my question in the beginning. What is it that keeps me from believing? It's my gain, it's my interest, my greed. They wanted to kill Jesus, as Jesus pointed out in verse 19, though they were not being honest about it. Jesus is telling them that not receiving his word is and will result in killing him. Not receiving the word. Although the religious leaders were not recognizing him and even trying to arrest him, other people at the temple began to see the point of his teaching and wondered about who Jesus is. See, they saw miracles, chapters 5 and 6. And then now they heard Jesus' teaching. What should be the natural result? The question mark is, when you see the, the miracles of Jesus, when you experience Jesus, Jesus in your life, and then you receive a teaching, what's the result? You believe him. That should be the natural result. Natural result should be that you come to believe in him. But if you cannot come to believe in him, even after that, Something is blocking you. Something has gone wrong. And during that time, it was because of their greedy and selfish agendas. As conclusion to his teachings, not conclusion to this sermon, as conclusion to his teachings, Jesus says this. This is the main passage. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, which is called Hoshana Rabbah, right? Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. See, Jesus showed them enough miracles to make them realize, this must be the one that is promised to come. Isaiah told us, he will release the, open the eyes of the blind, release the, the you know, paralyzed, the, the lame. He will save them. So Jesus did that according to the word. And then on, to add on to that, Jesus gave the teaching. People still didn't believe. So Jesus, here, just lays it out. What does this mean? I think I have preached uh, enough about this passage, but I will do it again. Uh, the great day, last day of the feast, of the tabernacles in Hebrew is Hoshana Rabbah. Hoshana, save us. 
Rama, great. This is the day when they were crying out, God save us. Save us. How? This is this day is connected with water. Because throughout these seven days, Feast of the Tabernacles, what they do is they do all the ceremonies in relation to water. Isaiah, uh, and this is one of the passages they read and they remember and they teach. Isaiah 12, 2 through 3, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my and song, and He has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. So they're crying out, Hoshana Rabbah, save us. And while they are doing that, the high priest goes down to the spring, uh, uh, to the spring, and uh, Siloam, and draws water for libation offering, which is also known as drink offering. They, he gives the offering of, of drink, of water, to God, and they shake willow branches. Willow is known for tree with water. And so they're asking for rain. This is the season when, uh, this is the time when it, turn, it changes from dry season to wet season. And God needs to send down this rain, early rain and late rain, in order for the fruit to, the harvest to be successful. So this is the time, because it, this is not in Egypt anymore. In Egypt, they depended on the Nile River. But now, they drink water, the ground drinks water from heaven. And who's the one, who's the only one who can give that water? God. So they pray to God through the seven days. And on the last day, if, the, if there is a rain, or if there is giving of water, they believe that it is uh, truly in this new year, because the farming year begins with Tishri. This new year will be a successful one, a blessed one. So water they are seeking for is the water of life and water of blessing. And Jesus stands up in the middle of the temple and says, those who are thirsty, come to me. And what will happen? Waters of life, living waters will flow out of where? Your belly, meaning in the midst of you, from your center will come out, continue to flow out, flow out water. So you won't need to ask, or you won't need to, to be dry anymore. You don't have to worry about it. It's kind of like, in today's terms, come to me, what are you asking for? What, what do we ask for? Money. Come to me and your bank will continue to overflow with money. Basically what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I am the one. I am the one that has been giving you that water. I am the one that will give you the water. One thing you need to do, come to me. So Jesus gave, showed all these miracles they didn't believe, or they refused to believe. Jesus taught the word, they still refused to believe. Jesus now says, okay, you are asking for that water today. Come to me, I'll give you that water. What is Jesus saying? I am the one. Not just the Messiah that is supposed to come. I am the one that has been giving you water. I am the one that brought you out of Egypt. I am the one that led you through wilderness. I am the one that will continue to bless you. So you make your choice. You come to me or not. This is the day when they remembered and praised God for feeding them manna through the wilderness and giving them water that continued to flow for those who are thirsty. They were seeking for water throughout the week. And on the last day, Jesus stands there and says that. So to recap, let's see what happened. This is the feast, the purpose of the feast for them to remember what God did. Okay? God saved Israel from the waters of Egypt, Nile, the waters below, that they depended their life on, and saved them from their long suffering. They were suffering in Egypt without much hope. They were crying out to God, but then not much hope. Nobody is there to save us. 
So they depended on the river somehow okay, to lengthen their life. John chapter 5, Jesus comes to a man who is long-suffering, depending on another body of water below, waiting for some kind of miracle to come down from heaven, but they were depending on that water below. He was aimlessly depending on the waters on the ground, just waiting, just like the Israelites in Egypt. But Jesus saves them. This is all water of healing. God allowed the Israelites to walk over the waters after saving them from Egypt, walk over the waters of the Red Sea and provided heavenly bread to eat in the wilderness. John chapter 6, Jesus provided miraculous bread in the barren field, just like God provided bread in the wilderness. And he walked on water to save his disciples from, from, uh, from that uh, danger. See, the Israel, God saved the Israelites by making them walk. Jesus came walking on water and made Peter walk on water. God provided water from the rock and the water continued to flow. Water followed them. Do you know where the Bible where in the Bible it tells us that the water followed them? The rock followed them? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. It says the rock followed them. Right? The water continued to follow, they continued to flow amongst them. John chapter 7, Jesus declares that he is the giver of water, and the water will continue to flow in the midst of you, from your belly. Jesus, not only on the day of this, this uh, last day, Roshana Shabbat, Roshana Rabbah, but Throughout, he was fulfilling, he was showing them, I am the one that brought you out of Egypt. I am the one that made you walk over and across the Red Sea. I am the one that gave you manna. I am the one that gave you water. I came and I'm reenacting all this. And finally, he comes stands. You remember at uh, Refidim, is it? They were complaining about water, thirst. And what did God say? Come to the rock. I will stand on that rock and face you. Just, I can't kind of imagine Jesus standing on the temple, in the midst of the temple, looking down at the people. Come. Come to me. First rock they had to hit. Jesus is now saying, come, speak to me, ask me. I'll give you water. Jesus gave all the answers. I believe God, our Father, has given us all the answers. But we're trying to ignore it by saying, this is something wrong with this teaching, or something wrong with this, that, and that, that, I cannot accept. Are we being like the religious, religious leaders during that time? What if this is the only chance for us to come to Him? During that week, this is the last thing we're going to read before we finish. During that week, somehow they memorized and read and preached about this passage. Remember this passage, this verse, because this will continue on to next week. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. <clears throat> o Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away on earth will be written down because they have forsaken the fountain of living water, even though. Jesus is the fountain of the Lord. Jesus just proclaimed, declared, I am the fountain of this water. Water of life and water of blessing, water of healing that you've been asking for. I am, here I am. Come and take it. But if you reject it, if you forsake that fountain of the living water, what will happen? Their names will be written down. Just as a hint, in chapter 8, what happens? Do 
do you not get excited about this John studies and you know before you come to church at least read that passage or, or see even see uh, you know look through it's just one more chapter read one more chapter to see what's next or do you come saying is he going to preach about John again when's he going to be finished John has still 13, 14 more chapters left. <laughs> we will finish soon. But what happens is they bring a, a woman caught in adultery. And Jesus stoops down and writes. And some, some Jew, Jewish rabbis say, I'm not saying this is the answer. We don't know what he wrote. But they're saying, Maybe he wrote their names. Because they know this passage really well. Can you imagine you're th trying to throw a rock? And Jesus writes, he, he writes on the ground and you look at it. And your name, he wrote your name. He's not supposed to know your name, but he wrote your name. And you, you've been reading. Those who reject and, and uh, forsake the fountain of the living water, their names will be written down. How scary would that be? I would drop the, the rock and go home. We don't know what he wrote. But this is why some of the uh, scholars and Jew, uh, rabbis say, maybe Jesus wrote down each of those people's names. It's, I, mean, I cannot say that's, that's it, but wouldn't it be scary? But apart from that, I pray that none of our names will be written down because we reject the fountain of the living waters. Where is the fountain of the living waters? Let us believe that this word is being proclaimed. Amen. This trumpet is being blown. Amen. The water is flowing out, just like from Ezekiel's temple. Let us pray. If, if not, let us pray that God will start to send forth that water of life from the center of this pulpit from Zion Church, from the center of your life. If you come to Jesus, water starts to flow out of your belly, you become the Ezekiel's temple. So let us, let us believe that that day has come. And it all depends on us. What are we going to do with that water? If we don't let it flow out, it becomes a contained water, becomes still water, dead water. It needs to continue to flow in order for it to be a living water. So I pray that each and every one here in our, our Zion Church will become the source of the living water and the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? Let us pray.